as I was saying, this event is being recorded and a link will be made available to you. But again, watching the recording doesn't qualify you to earn a continuing education credit. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. But otherwise, let me go ahead and introduce you to your facilitator for today, Dr. Bobby Redwood. Um, Dr. Redwood is an MD, MPH. He is a graduate of Rush University School of Medicine in Chicago and the University of Wisconsin Emergency Medicine and Preventative Residencies. He works full-time as an emergency and preventative medicine physician at Divine Savior Hospital in Portage, Wisconsin, and is chair of the hospital's antimicrobial stewardship committee. Dr. Redwood also teaches resident physicians and publishes research as a clinical adjunct professor for the UW Department of Family Medicine. He is the immediate past president of the Wisconsin chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians in 2017. So now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Redwood. All right, thank you, Shruti. Um, and thanks for everyone for attending the webinar today. Um, as you know, I'm particularly passionate about uh, antimicrobial stewardship. As an emergency physician in the ED, I see a lot of multidrug resistant organisms, hospital acquired infections, um, consequences of antibiotics like anaphylaxis or C. diff. And so it's um, very rewarding to get to talk to you all and uh, work on upstream causes of um, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and then specifically using fewer antibiotics. The topics that we choose for this series uh, come from feedback, from member feedback. And uh, what you guys want to hear about are things that you can do today um, in your practice, changes you can make to improve antibiotic usage. Looking over the call list today, we have a vast um, array of, of listeners. So we have uh, physicians, we have advanced practice providers, we have pharmacists, we have clinical nurse directors, we have quality directors in the room. And so I'm very happy that everyone's in attendance because this is a multidisciplinary topic uh, for sure. As Shruti mentioned, we really want people to chime in during the case studies. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present cases where we're going to choose whether or not to prescribe an antibiotic and if so, which antibiotic to use. And I want to use from you guys, I want to hear from you guys which antibiotic you would choose or whether you would treat in this case. And so even if you're not a clinician, if you're not a physician, if you're not an advanced practice provider, feel free to chime in. Um, for example, if you're a quality professional, you might say, this is how we would treat this, I think, in my health system. Um, the conversation is going to be that much richer if we are having a back and forth about um, these cases. Because it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray areas in terms of diagnosis and which antimicrobials to choose. All right, I'm just going to reach over to advance my slides here. So we're working on getting my clicker working here, but the agenda today is going to be a brief introduction on antimicrobial stewardship for, you know, if you attended the first webinar, you probably already have that introduction, but for those of us who are new to the topic, uh, then we're going to dive right in with um, case studies, so five key areas where we can use fewer antimicrobials, um, and then leave 15 minutes at the end uh, for those of you who want to ask questions. And I think that really is the, the meat and potatoes of this discussion. Great. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, in fact, I'm telling people to use fewer pharmaceuticals, so no one's really reaching out to me on that front. Uh, that's fine with me. <laughs> And again, these are our aims and outlines. The, the heart of this is going to be to talk about opportunities to not prescribe antibiotics or to use fewer antibiotics. Now, we talk about antimicrobial stewardship. Um, it's essentially synonymous with antibiotic stewardship, but it, include, it includes um, antifungals and antivirals, which are part of this conversation as well, but a, a minor part. And the, the biochemistry here is that when we use antibiotics, we exert selective pressure on pathogens. What does that mean? It means when we use an antibiotic, we kill off the weakest species first. So the, the wimpiest uh, bacteria are gonna die first, leaving only the strong or the uh, resistant organisms. And they have plasmids and ways of, um, of conveying resistance to other organisms and creating what we call multi-drug resistant organisms, which is really what we're trying to prevent here. Now, this, um, this spans a lot of different industries, but the meat industry, the veterinary industry, and human medicine are the big three. And in veterinary and human medicine, we practice evidence-based medicine, and so we're working on compiling evidence on how to improve our usage of antimicrobials. Uh, and the, the topic today is based on the best available evidence for each of these specific conditions we'll be talking about. <laughs> 
The scope of the problem is large. So 700,000 annual deaths attributed to resistant organisms annually. In the U.S., that translates to about 2 million illnesses, 23,000 deaths per year, and costs of somewhere between 20 and $35 billion, with 8 million additional patient days in the hospital. Um, so it's a big deal. The interesting part about antimicrobial stewardship, the, the thing that makes it so important, is that we can actually reverse it. So when you take off that selective pressure, when you stop using the antimicrobials, we will find that our antibiotics actually become effective again. Uh, and so those, those weaker species repopulate into our community biome and drugs that were, no, that were not effective will become effective once again. And so when you have an antimicrobial stewardship program at your hospital, the goal is in your community biome to reclaim the efficacy of your antibiotics. Now, the mantra in antimicrobial stewardship is the right drug, the right dose, and the right duration. That means choosing the narrowest spectrum drug that is going to work for your bacterial pathogen, choosing the smallest dose that's going to work, and choosing the smallest duration that's going to work. Um, and then we always add right diagnosis, because if you're treating a virus with an antibiotic, um, that's overuse of antibiotics by definition. Now, the reason, you know, this has been going on since the advent of Resistance has been going on since the advent of antibiotics, um, but it's becoming more pertinent in recent times. Um, and there's a big reason for that is we are not developing new antibiotics. In the 80s, we had 16 new antibiotics. In the 90s, only 10. In the 2000s, only five. Between 2008 and 2012, there was one new antibiotic developed. And only 1% of our pharmaceutical companies have active antibacterial discovery programs. So the low-hanging fruit of antibiotic development has already been picked. We used to be able to innovate our ways out of this. So we used to be able to create new antibiotics that would deal with the problem of resistant organisms. Now we find that we have to actually be protective of our current antibiotics uh, so that we can continue to treat common infections. Uh, and then there's this, superbugs. This was something that used to be a myth, lore, something that we talk about could potentially happen in the future. Organisms that are literally not treatable with any antibiotic on Earth. Um, and they are now here. They've ar arrived in the U.S. as well. And if superbugs become common, if superbugs become common like MRSA or um, VRE, we're going to find a time when really, uh, really easy things in healthcare, outpatient surgery, um, cesarean sections, become actual discussions of life threat. Uh, because if, if you go for a cesarean birth and you get a multi-drug resistant organism that is literally untreatable, um, that could be life-threatening. So obviously we want to avoid this future. We want to save our antibiotics now while we still can. So we're using the word overuse here. Um, some people have said it has a negative connotation, which it kind of does, but it's a very appropriate word. So you could say judicious use of antibiotics. You could say appropriate use of antibiotics. Um, but what we're trying to curb is overuse, using an antibiotic when it's not needed. And what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of different scenarios where this comes up. Uh, the most common, and the one we'll be talking about a lot today, is treating a viral pathogen um, with an antibiotic. Now, a lot of this has to do with dogma. A lot of this has to do with CYA medicine or, or just-in-case treatment. And we're trying to move away from that um, in the profession of medicine in general and really be specific in our diagnosis, have confidence in our diagnosis, and get more comfortable with treatment failure if we're wrong, um, which, is, which is an acceptable way to practice. You could also choose an antibiotic that's unlikely to be effective against a suspected pathogen. Uh, and so a common example of that might be azithromycin in the upper Midwest. It's 50% effective against atypical pneumonias, but it's still commonly used for pneumonia. In reality, people are probably treating bronchitis with azithromycin, an unnecessary antibiotic, choosing an antibiotic that's not even going to be very effective. We might use an overly broad-spectrum antibiotic. So if a healthy young person comes in with uncomplicated cystitis and we're using Zosin, that's too broad of an antibiotic. That's putting that person at risk for multidrug resistant organisms. That's putting your community at risk for um, resistant bacteria. Double coverage when only single coverage is needed. That's a big one. So we do a lot of just-in-case coverage. The, the class one would be cellulitis. So if you have a purulent cellulitis, something where you see pus around the margins, that's likely a gram-positive organism. We are moving away from using uh, gram-negative coverage for strep just in case. And there's many other examples of that that we'll get into. Finally, antibiotics for longer or higher doses than the literature recommends. Uh, and I think the electronic health record has actually done us a disservice on this. So you go to write your prescription and you just choose the default choice. 
Um, if it's a dog bite and I'm looking for three days of prophylaxis, I don't need 10 days of Augmentin. But sometimes that's the only choice that pops up. Um, and so with a lot of production pressure on clinicians and the five-minute visits or the 10-minute visits, we have to make smart systems and also make the smart choice um, when, we're, when we have a recommended course of antibiotics. And then uh, infection prophylaxis without sufficient evidence. And so this comes up time and time again, especially with outpatient surgeries, um, when to use antibiotic prophylaxis and which antibiotics to use. Uh, and that's something that we'll talk more about as well. So let's dive right in. This is our first case. Um, these are not comprehensive question stems. This is kind of just to get the conversation started. Uh, a 43-year-old male presents with bilateral sinus pressure and cough for five days. He has thick yellow drainage, um, a fever of 100.2, and he reports that he gets sinus infections every winter and that they improve with a ZPAC. He uh, does have mid-face pressure, but it doesn't worsen when you tap on the middle of his face. And so I really want a brave soul out there to speak up. You don't need to be a physician. You don't need to be an advanced practice provider, anyone out there. Tell me, would you treat this patient with an antibiotic or not? And if so, which one would you use? No, don't treat this person. Because <laughs> we're divine savior. <laughs> no, we hey, would not treat that's this my person. Gang. How are you guys? <laughs> Great. We would not treat this person. Very good. Do you want to elaborate on that at all? Um, I think the CDC says you're supposed to be ill for 10 to 14 days before we treat and uh, really doesn't seem sick enough. Healthy person. Very good, that's a great starting point for this conversation. So the, the first question, is, of course, is if we are gonna treat, what are we even talking about treating? And um, what we're talking about is acute bacterial rhinosynovitis. So that's the question of the day with this patient is, does this patient have acute bacterial rhinosynovitis or a bacterial sinus infection? And I'm not saying he does, I'm just saying that's the question of the day. Um, the organisms are the usual suspects for the upper respiratory tract, uh, strep pneumonia, non-typable H flu, Moraxella catarralis. And the thing that you might not know is that uh, I always like to remind people that, you know, not too long ago, less than a century ago, there were not antibiotics. We didn't have antibiotics. And people still got over their sinus infections without antibiotics. So 80% of the time with no antibiotics, true bacterial sinusitis will resolve within two weeks. The number needed to treat to relieve symptoms is 18. So you have to prescribe 18 people antibiotics to give one person symptom improvements. And the number needed to harm in general for antibiotics is eight. Um, and the harm includes things like diarrhea, rash, adverse drug offense, GI upset. So two people will suffer some probably minor harm to give one person relief of symptoms. And then there are, of course, deadly com complications of bacterial sinusitis, brain abscess, periorbital cellulitis, meningitis. Um, but the complication rate is pretty low for hospitalized patients, and those are usually patients who need IV antibiotics who have failed outpatient treatment, the rate is 3.7%. Um, so if you take the sickest of the sick cohort, they have about a 4% rate of these um, bad complications. And if you look at the literature behind that, uh, they are usually multi-drug resistant organisms. Now in the right-hand column, we have the rules of the road. So you, you guys correctly identified the CDC's criteria or the Infectious Diseases Society of America. They say treat if there's 10 days of cough without improvement. That's because for the first nine days, viral sinusitis perfectly mimics bacterial sinusitis. The most astute infectious disease physicians cannot tell the difference between the two. They look the same. Essentially, your sinuses are clogged. There's a bunch of fluid in there. You have the symptoms of facial pain. You have the symptoms of fever, but it's not yet become a bacterial infection. Severe facial pain and fever for three to four days. And this is why this case is interesting, because you could make this patient have these symptoms. For me, severe means needing IV or IM pain medication. So if a patient does not need IV medication, I don't count that as severe. That's a judgment call. Some people would say, hey, this guy's suffering. He's had severe facial pain for five days now. I'm going to treat based on that. That's your call, um, but we'll talk about why that's, uh, we'll talk about the nuances of making that call. And then the doubling of symptoms. So the doubling of symptoms refers to someone who had classic viral symptoms, and then suddenly in the midst of their illness, usually when they're getting better, 
their symptoms sort of spike and they get high fever, they get severe pain, maybe a change in their drainage, their, their sinus drainage. And, and that makes a lot of sense. You have essentially a clogged sinuses, you have stasis of fluid, and that fluid gets a super infection from a bacterial source and becomes a quasi abscess in your mid face. So these are the times when you're allowed to treat. And if you do treat, um, because overtreatment is a problem, if we do treat, we choose amoxicillin BID for 10 days. It's going to cover 80% of your organisms. It's going to cover H flu and strep pneumonia. Um, and so the, the common practice of using augmentin for um, bacterial sinusitis is probably too big a gun. Um, you will get slightly, more, slightly fewer treatment failures if you use augmentin. There's no doubt about that. But this is this natural tension between individual health and public health where we try to choose the uh, narrower spectrum agent that's going to cover most of the organism. So I would agree with our, thank you guys for calling, for, uh, for chiming in there. I would totally agree with you. I would not treat this patient. I would not even give a watch and wait prescription. I would be confident calling this viral sinusitis. If I'm wrong, I would be, feel comfortable having a treatment failure and ask the patient to come back if they get um, some of those more concerning symptoms. So if you start seeing facial cellulitis, severe headache, um, if they're getting uh, any sort of neurologic symptoms, I would want them to come back to me. This is one of our greatest sins as practitioners is viral sinusitis. 99% of the time, it's a virus, 99%. Um, this is from the literature. So, you know, I work in the emergency department in a given cold and flu season, I may well see 100 patients who present with sinusitis. One of them will be bacterial. Yet 81% of the time, these patients are getting antibiotics. I really hope this is changing. That literature is a few years old already. Um, I, I'm really seeing greater awareness of this, not just among our clinicians, but also among our patients. We have trained our patients to do this. We've trained our patients to come in every year when you have sinus pressure for your ZPAC. Um, and so it's a process not just of educating clinicians, but also educating our patients that the true treatment for this is saline irrigation and intranasal steroids if they have reactive airway, history of asthma, anything like that. Um, and then, like we mentioned, when we do treat bacterial sinusitis, augmentin seems to be the default choice for a lot of health centers. Um, and I would, I would challenge you to choose amoxicillin first. It's a narrower spectrum agent, and it is, um, it's 4% less effective than augmentin. So you're going to have 4% more treatment failures, um, but you're going to be saving augmentin for those uh, more serious infections that you need it for. Uh, and then clinical pearl here, what actually works, we mentioned nasal steroids and, um, and saline irrigation. The idea is to unplug the sinuses. So you've got a quasi -ab abscess in there or you've got fluid causing facial pressure. When you disrupt that mucus plug and allow the sinuses to drain, that's when the patient's actually going to feel better. Um, I would love to think that oral decongestions, nasal decongestions, mucolytics actually work. The evidence really isn't there. Some patients say they do work. Um, it's not bad to try them. They may allow a patient to perform or feel less congested for a day or two, um, but they don't seem to treat the actual source. So, any questions before we move on to the next clinical case on sinusitis? Just remember, 99% of the time it's viral. If your gut tells you it's viral, it absolutely is. If you're hedging and you're not sure if it's bacterial, it's probably viral. Um, and, you know, the other thing I sometimes see is uh, CT evidence of sinusitis without symptoms. I don't treat that either. And so if a patient has CT evidence plus symptoms, sure, go ahead and treat that. But sometimes we get these incidental head CTs where they'll comment that the patient has sinusitis with no mid-face pressure, no uh, fevers, anything like that. Um, that's probably chronic sinusitis and does not require antibiotics. All right, case two. I'm, I'm loving the brave souls who chimed in. I'm looking for more. We have a healthy three-year-old female. She has two days of fever, 101.5, uh, and right ear pain. Mom is concerned that she has an ear infection, and the right tympanic membrane looks like this. Do we treat or not? And if you're treating with an antibiotic, which one do you choose? You're staring in the kid's ear, looking at the TM, what's going through your head? 
All right, going once. Going twice. We agree to hear that it's a serous hepatitis because so light reflux. It's clear liquid or clear fluid behind there. We do not, we would not treat it. Bless your hearts for chiming in. I am uncomfortable with silence, but this really does make the, or I'm very comfortable with silence, but this makes the conversation that much better. So what I heard was this is a serous We still have a light reflex, would not treat in this case. Very good. Now, the qu again, the question of the day is, is this acute otitis media or a bacterial middle ear infection? The usual suspects, once again, strep pneumonia, non-typable age flu, and moraxella. Um, and like we saw with sinusitis, 60% of the time, true acute otitis media will resolve within 24 hours without treatment. So even if this is a, a bacterial source, 60% of the time it'll get better without treatment. Why is that? Well, the swelling in the canal might go down. Maybe you're using ibuprofen, maybe natural course of disease. Finally, it allows drainage and the quasi abscess behind the tympanic membrane can now drain into the sinuses, be swallowed and go away. Um, the number needed to treat to relieve symptoms is 20. The number needed to treat to uh, prevent TM rupture is 33. The incidence of mastoiditis or meningitis, those scary complications, is exceedingly small. Um, and then on the right, we have the list of the list of findings that point towards bacterial um, acute otitis media. Now, in sinusitis, the uh, the criteria for diagnosis I think are actually pretty liberal. In acute otitis media, they are very liberal. So you're allowed to treat if you have essentially a fever, um, pain, and a bulging tympanic membrane. The question is, should you treat? Um, and so, it, you know, different societies have different guidelines on, on when to make the diagnosis. I, I think they're all very, very liberal. Um, and I would have, I would encourage clinicians to be comfortable with uncertainty and practice a watch and wait prescription if it's a soft call diagnosis in any way. So if you look at these 10 bullet points on the right, this is kind of the menu of symptoms for acute otitis media. Those first three are extremely low specificity. So the parent comes in saying, I think he may have an ear infection. You look in the TM and it's red and the patient has pain. Uh, those are very general symptoms and essentially anyone coming in with an ear complaint is probably gonna have two out of three, if not three out of three of those. Uh, we all know that fever can give you an erythematous tympanic membrane. We all know that any effusion behind the ear can give you um, pain. And we all know that most parents, when their kid having pain, the first thing you're gonna suspect is an ear infection. I do that too, that's just human nature. I like symptoms four through 10 a little bit better. So if you see a true effusion, that's telling, that's interesting. Doesn't have to be um, acute otitis media. Like we mentioned, this wasn't a serous otitis media in the picture. That was not a bacterial ear infection. Um, purulence is very telling for bacterial infection. Air fluid levels, again, if you have gas producing organisms. Um, an opaque TM, loss of light reflex, loss of bony landmarks, or if we're still using pneumatic otoscopy, immobility on pneumatic otoscopy. Those are all much more specific um, in terms of diagnosing acute otitis media. And so it really matters what you see. I don't think on presentation um, you can get very far. It matters what, when you look in the ear, what you actually see. And I like to see more than just a bulging TM. Why do we overtreat? Again, we're, we're treating viruses. That's why we overtreat. A lot of it is history, a lot of it is dogma, and we're trying to move away from that. 50 to 78% uh, of the time, of we diagnose it as bacterial otitis media, it really is. So a little better than sinusitis, but I also think that those numbers might be a little better because the criteria is so loose. Um, and I wonder if as this discussion evolves over the next few years, if we'll see um, guidelines that are actually requiring stricter diagnostic criteria. The other thing I sometimes see is that otitis externa is treated with oral antibiotics. And these are the two reasons I, I hear that happening. One, I think that sometimes people actually mistake the diagnosis. So otitis externa is external ear infection or infection of the canal, um, where you might see an exudate in the canal, you might have pain with tragal traction, you might have some ear drainage, might happen after swimming in a pool or another body of water. Um, that is treated with topical drops, not oral antibiotics. That would be an example of antibiotic overuse to use oral antibiotics because it's, it's basically too big of a gun. It's using too aggressive a treatment. Um, and sometimes I'll, I'll see, I review a lot of charts on, on antimicrobial stewardship. Sometimes I'll see the clinician write that they couldn't visualize the TM, so as a just-in-case measure, they treat it with an oral antibiotic as well. 
Um, that's probably overkill. If you can't see the TM, but you have a clear diagnosis of otitis externa, simply treat as otitis externa. You don't need that double coverage with an oral antibiotic. Um, and then just like sinusitis, when people do treat acute otitis media, the treatment of choice is amoxicillin. Augmentin is too big of a gun for this. Um, and so we don't need to use uh, the broader spectrum antibiotic when we know that it's probably strep or uh, non-typable H flu. Now on the right hand side here, this is something that, uh, that really helped me solidify my, my confidence in sending, um, sending these kids home, right? Because the patients often want an antibiotic. The parents are kind of expecting an antibiotic. The kids are in pain. That's kind of a tough room to be in. And I tell my patients that, or I tell the parents that when you have a virus, it causes a spasm in the inner ear. It can cause fluid buildup behind the ear, and it can look and feel a lot like an ear infection, but it's going to get better within 24 hours. Interestingly, of this uh, spasm of the eustachian tube can actually cause a retraction of the TM as well. It just depends on which way the fluid goes. So it can give you the effusion, it can give you the um, retraction, but that's why viral uh, ear infections mimic bacterial ear infections, is because they cause that serocytitis media uh, that our astute callers identified. So congratulations to you guys. That was, a, that was a very good choice on your part. You could probably make the case that that patient fit diagnostic criteria. They have pain, they have fever, they have an effusion, but I strongly suspect that that patient had viral process and would have gotten better without antibiotics. I would feel very comfortable giving them no prescription or a watch and wait prescription. Case three, a 65 year old female with no symptoms, uh, no urinary symptoms grows pseudomonas, a bad bug, on her pre-op screening for urine culture before a total knee replacement. Do we treat? Nope. No, because she didn't have any symptoms and it could be asymptomatic bacteria. All right, we got some ringers out there. Exactly, if you were at the last webinar, you know, we kind of hammer home asymptomatic bacteriuria because it's such a big deal. It's a much bigger deal than sinusitis. This is the asymptomatic urinary tract infection. So this patient has bacteria in their bladder, bacteria that's typically pathologic, but they have no symptoms. So I have very low suspicion that this bacteria has invaded the bladder wall, that the bacteria has seeded to the bloodstream, that the bacteria is ascending up the urinary tract. With these, if these things are happening, the patient is going to develop symptoms. And you can feel, feel very confident not treating this at this time. Of course, you counsel the patient to come back if it gets worse. Um, there's a good chance that if this patient urinated the next day, they would not have that bacteria. Um, this woman has functional immobility, or we know that she has uh, issues with mobility. She needs a knee replacement. And uh, people who have issues with mobility are at high risk for having asymptomatic bacteriuria. Um, it might be hard to clean in that area because of functional uh, limitations, or, or they might delay going to the bathroom, delay urination, because it hurts to get up and move and get into the toilet and pull your pants down. And so um, the elderly population, the nursing home population, people with functional impairment um, have a ASB rate of somewhere between 5 and 50%, depending on the level of their impairment. So this patient represents one of those high-risk populations for having asymptomatic bacteriuria. It's such a key important, it's so important because um, E. coli is particularly facile at developing resistance. And we have, um, because we have nursing homes, because we have uh, functionally impaired people living in a group home setting, we have, uh, we have places where resistance can spread easily. And so we wanna be particularly astute about not treating ASB in this population. Uh, and if you get it, similar to sinusitis, a little bit worse, we have 80% discordance between recommended practices and actual practices with asymptomatic bacteriuria. These are the myths. You may have heard them before. If you're hearing them for the first time, um, then feel free to chime in with questions. Uh, a big one is catheters. So when you see a change in urine appearance in a catheter, if the urine becomes foul smelling, if it becomes dark, if you see sediment in the Foley bag, that's usually a sign of hydration status rather than an infection. Uh, and does not need to be treated, does not need to be sent, not unless the patient has altered mental status, sepsis, flank pain, fever. We see a lot of convenience screening, again, especially with production pressures. In the land of the five-minute visit, if the, if the patient's urinating now, um, nursing is going to collect that urine and wait on it. Well, that's fine. We can collect the urine, but we should only send it if we have a good reason for sending it, uh, and that good reason is symptoms, frequency, dysuria, fever, flank pain lab professionals out there. So if you're working in a lab or you're or affiliated with the lab, 
absolutely be sure that contaminated samples are not being sent for culture. The problem with cultures are being read two to three days later, often by someone who does not know the patient. And so if something with five or greater squamous, cell, squamous epithelial cells is sent for culture, um, that may well grow a bacteria that appears to be pathologic. That patient may well get a call from someone that they haven't met before um, prescribing an antibiotic that's really not needed. And so contaminated cultures continue to be a problem. We have protocols written against this. We have checks and balances, and still it happens all the time. Um, and so just be alert for that on, in your institution. And then I call this protocol inertia, um, but there's a lot of protocols written by non-medical people or by people who aren't seeing the patients themselves where we're just sending UAs kind of automatically. So in the emergency world, we're doing this for medical clinics, for psych patients, for jail patients, even traumas. You know, you get in a fender bender, you have no injuries from it, but a urine was sent and you have some bacteria in the urine. You get sent home from your trauma case with an antibiotic. You wouldn't have even been in a healthcare setting that day if you hadn't had a fender bender. And so just keep an eye out for these protocols and try to rewrite them or um, make the default choice no urinalysis unless it's absolutely necessary. And then these are your hall passes. There are exactly three times when we can treat ASB. Uh, once in early pregnancy, and the, the myth here is that if it's, if some people will treat if it's on a single screening urinalysis, it has to be two consecutive urine cultures. Um, and so if a patient comes in with a positive urine culture the first time but no symptoms, even in the first trimester, you actually have them repeat the sample in one week and get a second, posit second positive culture. Uh, the second instant is um, pre-urologic procedure. That one makes a lot of sense. If the patient's urinary tract has bacteria in it, even if it's asymptomatic, if they're being instrumented, that could be seeded to adjacent tissue, so that makes sense to treat. And then post-renal transplant patients um, traditionally have been treated with antibiotics, uh, even if they're not symptomatic. The idea just being that they're immunosuppressed and the graft is that precious. Um, but this is actually changing and the literature is kind of starting to sway the opposite direction. So we'll see if that recommendation changes. But these are at the, the three and only three times that we treat asymptomatic bacteriuria in medicine. Case number four, the case of the nasty teeth, all right? It's a Wisconsin epidemic. I'm sure nationwide we're seeing this. It's really hard to get dental care, uh, specifically for your Medicaid population. And this 49-year-old male comes in with a deep black fissure in his first premolar. He has 10 out of 10 pain for five days. His gums are red, they're tender, but no fever, no lymph node involvement, no diffuse swelling in the face or in the peritonsillar area. What do we do with this patient? They're holding their jaw looking for relief. I need a brave soul to chime in. I would not give them an antibiotic. I would probably give them a periapical block, prescription for ibuprofen and follow up with your dentist. And would you tell me, what do you think is the, uh, what do you think is the diagnosis here? Hard to tell, the patient's not in front of you. It's a pretty limited question stem. I won't hold you to it. Uh, well, it could be that he has gingivitis. Maybe he needs a root canal. There's a filling replaced. I'm not a dentist, so. That's awesome, no, thank you very much. Yeah, so I think that's actually a very good answer. It could be tons of stuff. The answer is it could be tons of stuff. Let, dentistry is actually pretty easy because the one thing you have to remember is when you do treat. And when you treat is when you have infection seeding to adjacent tissues. So if you have, if you have uh, facial cellulitis or evidence of a peritonsillar abscess, that's when you're going to treat. Um, otherwise, antibiotics are essentially not indicated. So this is a chronic apical abscess. That means there's some dead tissue at the root of the tooth there. You, you look at those teeth. This has not been going on just for five days. This has been going on for five years. 
Um, that patient has necrotic tissue at the root of his tooth, and sometimes there's pus there, sometimes there's not. Sometimes there's swelling, sometimes there's not. The best treatment for him is to get the tooth pulled. The second best treatment is for that pus to, to weasel its way up around the tooth and form a drainage tract on its own. That's actually going to give him more relief than your temporary prescription for antibiotics, which the literature is kind of mixed, may or may not um, quash that infection down for a very temporary time. Um, rarely, it does happen, but rarely the infection goes the opposite way. Usually it goes upward towards the tooth, but it can work its way down into the jawbone or into the maxillary bone. If that happens, you'll see facial swelling and you'll treat with antibiotic. The other thing with dental infections, I love that line, I'm not a dentist. We are not dentists, it's true. And the thing that worries me about teeth and feet is this. Because we farm teeth and feet out to dentistry and podiatry, we sometimes forget all the diagnoses or all the pathophysiology here. And so I think it's pretty empowering just to look at the words. Just look at all of these different dental pathologies out there that cause pain, that cause swelling, um, that, pa that patients will come in with. So, you know, is it a dental carry? Is it just erosion of the enamel with bacterial in there? Is it reversible pulpitis? Has the enamel worn thin and now when you eat, um, put pressure on it or there's hot and cold, your pulp actually swells and it hurts? Irreversible pulpitis, the enamel is so thin that now the pulp is always hurting. Is it a tooth impaction? Is it a physics issue where you're just putting pressure on the nerves because the teeth don't have enough space? Has the gingiva receded enough that now there's some ex exposed tooth that's usually protected by soft tissue and it's hurting all the time, especially when exposed to hot or cold? Um, ex exososis is those little soft pink masses, those fleshy masses that just grow for no reason. Sometimes they're bony, sometimes they're not. They need to be cut off if they're causing pressure, um, but they don't need antibiotics. Is it dry socket? Has the patient already had their tooth pulled, but it's not forming the clock correctly, and there's some exposed bone there causing pain? What I see a lot on um, charts that I review is dental infection or dental abscess. These are kind of wastebasket terms. They encompass a, a lot of different, more specific diagnoses, but the problem I have with these terms is that they beg you to prescribe antibiotics. You're sitting there sending the patient out with an infection or an abscess, and not giving them antibiotics. Well, the fact of the matter is dentistry doesn't recommend these are treated with antibiotics. The treatment is tooth, uh, to have the tooth pulled, and you can send these patients home with confidence with no antibiotic uh, and NSAIDs only. So I totally agree with your management. I think it's right on. And if, if, you looked at, if anyone looked at those previous charts and those words are kind of foreign to you, um, just give it a look over, Wikipedia, any of those. Knowing those diagnoses will give you a lot more confidence when you send these patients home with no antibiotics. Um, and it'll give your patients some peace of mind knowing what their actual diagnosis is. This is another one of these cases where we've trained our patients. We've trained our patients to come in for um, an antibiotic every time they have dental pain. And we need to, you must unlearn what you have learned, to quote Yoda. Um, and so we're working with our providers, we're working with our patients to try to reverse this practice. Um, and then obviously, I'd love to see more dentists out there as well. Um, and just to reiterate, facial swelling or peritonsillar swelling, that is the time when we treat lymph node involvement as well, but basically spread to adjacent tissues. Um, and uh, again, we often see Augmentin used for this. When you do decide to treat, penicillin is perfectly acceptable. That is the antibiotic of choice. Um, and so unless the patient has a reason they're penallergic, uh, we should be using penicillin for dental infections across the board. Okay. We are winding up to our question and answer period. This is our final case. It's a 14-year-old male. He presents to clinic with fever of 102.2 for two days. He does have a cough. He has bilateral submandibular lymph nodes. Um, a classmate was, uh, had culture-proven group A strep. How would we approach this case? What are we thinking about? Do a rapid strep screen to see if it's positive for strep. All right. And then what if it's negative? Um, then just wait on it and give them saline um, gargles and um, it's probably viral then. Perfect. Thank you for chiming in. And if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, are you familiar with the Centaur criteria? Uh, no, I'm not. Excellent. Let's get right into it. So. The concern, of course, is for strep throat. So, you know, does this patient have a non-invasive bacterial infection of the pharyngeal epithelial cells, usually caused by strep pyogenes? So, um, this is this is a a known type of bacterial infection that usually you're seeing a virus, but sometimes it's bacterial. 
do we need to treat it? There are a lot of people out there who think we should not be treating strep throat at all. Um, it improves without treatment on average in three to four days, and the antibiotics reduce the length of symptoms by a whopping 16 hours. That's 20 tablets of amoxicillin in a person who has a sore throat for 16 hours of relief. I think it's kind of a tough sell in general to treat it. Um, there are peritonsillar abscesses out there. It's about three in a thousand. And rheumatic fever uh, is essentially non-existent in the U.S. anymore. And so maybe think of this more in your immigrant populations or someone who recently visited the U.S. Um, there are a lot of smart people out there, smart infectious disease physicians, who don't think we have rheumatic strains of group A strep at all anymore. Um, and maybe it's because we're treating it. You can make that argument. Um, but there is, uh, there's a lot of people out there who are saying that we shouldn't even be treating strep throat at all. Now, I understand that's not standard of care. Standard of care is to treat. I still treat, but let's treat wisely. Um, strep is overtreated, again, because we're usually treating a viral pathology as group A strep. Um, and so one of the things we use in medicine is pretest probability. So before we even send the test, let's make sure that this patient has a high probability of having the disease. That just gives you more bang for your buck with your test. If you were to test the entire world for group A strep right now, you'd have a bunch of false positives out there, people with zero symptoms who come back with a positive test. And so you want to make sure that you're treating people with a high pretest probability. And so the, the acronym is, um, or the mnemonic is Centaur here. What, the C is for cough, and it's the absence of cough. That buys you one point. So that points towards having strep. Exudates, or pus in the back of the throat, that gets you two points. Nodes, or lymph node involvement, that gets you three points. And then temperature or a fever, that gets you four points. So if you had those four things, you would have four out of five Centaur criteria. And then age. If you are younger than 15, that buys you a point. If you are older than 65, that actually subtracts a point. And so if you tallied up the patient in our STEM here, has, um, they, have, uh, they have a presence of a cough, so they do not get a point. They have no tonsillar exudate, so they do not have a point. They do have lymph nodes, yes. They do have fever, yes and they are younger than 15, so they would have three out of five Centaur criteria. And so basically, when someone has two or three Centaur criteria, that, that justifies that they're, they're low risk, but they're high enough risk to send a culture. When they have four or five Centaur criteria, they're high enough risk that you might send a rapid strep. Um, when someone has five out of five criteria, when they have all five criteria, they still only have a 56% chance of having strep. So if your clinical practice is, this smells like strep, I'm gonna treat it. If your clinical practice is, oh, their friend had strep, you probably have strep too, I'm gonna treat it. If your practice is, you have five out of five central criteria, I'm gonna treat it without testing. I would urge you to move away from that and only treat strep if you have a positive test. Now it gets a little dicey, there's two tests out there. One is the antigen, which is less specific, and then one is the, um, the PCR, which is very specific. And so in my center, we have the PCR, um, if I get a, a positive PCR, I'm testing for sure. Um, if you work in a center where you have the antigen, um, I would still send for culture if your antigen's negative, if your clinical suspicion is high. Um, and so those are kind of the two ways to use those tests. And I know that gets a little bit complicated, so I'm happy to field questions if people have specific questions about what you have in your center or how to use the Centaur criteria. All right. The next slide is our Q&A section, um, but coming soon, we're gonna be talking about shorter treatment durations. This is something I'm really excited about. Um, I love this quote, most treatment periods that appear in textbooks are lacking scientific evidence. So why are we treating strep for 10 days? Well, we're lacking scientific evidence, that's why. And we are in the Western world, we're starting to do studies to explore shorter courses of antibiotics. Now, in the third world or in resource poor environments where they don't have enough antibiotics, they've already done these studies. And so um, we already know that strep pneumo for or community acquired pneumonia can be treated uh, for three days instead of eight. Um, with meningitis, we can treat for three days instead of seven. Typhoid fever, three days instead of 14. Ventilator assisted pneumonia, eight days instead of 14. The problem with these is these are different bugs in different countries using different drugs than we use in the US. So we cannot extrapolate these research for um, data to the US, but in the era of antibiotic resistance, the studies are occurring in the US. And so I'm really excited to see guidelines coming out from IDSA to actually recommend shorter courses of antibiotics. In the meantime, what do we have? You open your Stanford Guide for Antibiotics and you see 
treatment for strep throat somewhere between seven and 10 days maybe. You might see treatment for UTI somewhere between seven and 10 days or five and seven days. You see a treatment range. And so what I tell clinicians is always use the lowest um, number of days treatment or the smallest dose treatment unless you have a really good reason not to. And so in the right-hand column here, we have lists of patients, patient characteristics that can justify your decision to use fewer antibiotics or a shorter course of antibiotics. So if it's fully susceptible to the pathogen, um, so group A strep's a great example. We know it's strep pyogenes. We know it should be susceptible to amoxicillin. That patient could get a shorter course. So if you have a range in your, in your antibiotic guide, use the shorter range. If the infectious site is accessible to antibiotics, that's the majority of outpatient infections right there. So anything in the upper respiratory tract, um, in, unless it's like an empyema or something, uh, a cellulitis, a UTI, uh, any of those are going to be acceptable to oral antibiotics. If it's a, an acute infection with a single pathogen, um, and so we have polymicrobial pathogens out there, aspiration, pneumonia, et cetera. But if you're talking about your garden variety, UTI, cellulitis, even community-acquired pneumonia, that's a single pathogen. Um, for skin infections, no foreign body, no abscesses. Uh, think about shorter courses of treatment. Um, extracellular pathogens, again, that's almost everything except chlamydia and uh, E. coli UTI. Um, but for your pneumonias, for your cellulitis, those are all extracellular. And then a healthy patient with normal defenses. So um, basically not immunosuppressed. Even, you know, most controlled diabetics I consider having normal defenses. We get caught in this trap of thinking that all uh, diabetics are at risk for um, for worsening infection, but if your sugars are pretty well controlled, I consider that normal defenses. And so these are patients who I would consider using um, whatever your recommendations are, the shorter end of recommendations. We're wrapping up here. These are my clothing, closing thoughts. 99% um, of sinusitis is viral, so treat sinusitis as viral unless strict criteria are met. You have to have a strong case to call it bacterial. Consider watch and wait prescriptions for acute otitis media, if, especially if diagnosis is uncertain. And let's be honest, it's uncertain a lot of the time. Avoid screening for and treating asymptomatic bacteriuria. This is a dinosaur waiting for a tar pit. I want to see this practice gone entirely. I think we're making great strides. Just knowing that that term exists, just knowing that um, patients have transient normal bacteria that they urinate out of their system is empowering and can allow us to not treat these quote unquote infections. Um, avoid using antibiotics for routine dentalgia. There's a dozen other diagnoses out there besides dental abscess. Dental abscess is a wastebasket diagnosis. Only treat if you have facial cellulitis or spreading to adjacent tissues and lymph nodes. And finally, use the Centaur criteria for pharyngitis and only treat if you have a positive test, either culture or a rapid strep antigen or strep PCR. And with that, we have 10 more minutes. I'm gonna open up the floor. I welcome your questions. Thank you, everyone. You can either put your questions in the chat box or you can just go ahead and unmute your line and go ahead. So for the quality folks out there, um, a simple quality improvement project that you can work on is to look at your default orders in the electronic health record. Team up with a physician champion and, and just see if the orders make sense. So when someone types in amoxicillin, is it always a 14-day prescription? Is it always a 10-day prescription? And then look at their Sanford antibiotic guide or whatever guide they're using and see if there's an option for shorter courses of antibiotics. That's something where I would venture to say most hospitals probably have default settings that, that might err on the high side, um, and that's something that you could probably do pretty easy. Um, we talk about low resource settings where, um, where there's not enough antibiotics to go around. I consider my hospital a low resource setting. My patients cannot afford the antibiotics I'm prescribing. So if we're talking about 20 days or 20 tablets of Augmentin for a dog bite versus six tablets for prophylaxis, that's a pretty compelling reason to, to use a lower dose um, is that the patient will be able to afford that. All right, so we've got some questions here. Uh, 
One, one listener is asking, I'm curious if the treatment plan for sinusitis would have been different if the drainage had been green instead of yellow. Uh, that's a great question. It would not have been different. So um, we see green and yellow drainage regardless of whether it's viral or bacterial. And so I, I would call that a myth that, uh, that we wouldn't, that wouldn't really affect your decision one way or another. You know, with COPD, um, with uh, emphysema, we sometimes use change in sputum color as a indication that there might be a bacterial infection. That's based on the gold criteria, and even that's kind of weak evidence. And so to be honest, even with COPDers, I don't put a lot of emphasis on change in sputum color. Uh, but great question. That's something that we hear a lot. And for me, that's not a very meaningful um, aspect of the history and physical. Another question, we are currently using rapid strep testing plus PCR strep if strep is negative. Oh, interesting. Regarding the Centaur criteria, would there be a reason to run a PCR only and not a rapid? Yeah, you know, the, the downside of the PCR is it takes longer. It's 20 minutes instead of five minutes. Um, but I think, to me, that sounds like redundant testing. I would use the, if you have strep PCR, that is the more sophisticated test. I would use PCR only. The thing I like about PCR, you have to wait 20 minutes, yes, but you're you're going to get much better information. I don't know the exact sensitivity and specificity, but I believe the antigen's around 70% and the PCR is around 98%. So it's a much better test, and it, it eliminates the need to send a culture. So when my PCR is positive, I trust that it's positive. When it's negative, I trust it's negative, and I don't send a culture. With the antigen, if the clinical suspicion is high and it's negative, I don't really trust that. I end up sending the culture. So that's interesting, kind of using that two-step two process. I think that's probably to save some time because the rapid strep antigen is just a five-minute test. But uh, if I had my druthers, I would use PCR only and just accept that your patients are going to have to wait around 15 more minutes. Another question. With not treating for strep or sinus infections, how long is someone contagious? When employing team members, how long should they stay off work? So, so when I hear when not treating, so that's interesting because what's actually more contagious than the bacterial infection is the viral infection. So viruses are really contagious. Bacterial infections actually are much less contagious. And so someone is most contagious when their viral load is peaking. And that is usually when their fevers are peaking. So when someone is most febrile is when they're most contagious. And so if you want to go, the strictest criteria that I give people is be symptom-free for 24 hours um, before returning to your environment. That's if you're working with the elderly, with infants, with the immunocompromised. The reality is people have to go back to work. They have to go back to school. And they're usually going to go back when they have some symptoms. So for that population, you might say, fever-free for 24 hours. I think that's a pretty reasonable way to go, even if they still have persistent rhinorrhea and cough. I mean, it's a judgment call. I send a lot of people home with masks. So I'll give someone a respiratory mask for essentially for droplet precautions and ask that they wear their mask to work, that they cough into their sleeve, that they wash their hands. But people are going to go back to work when they still have symptoms. They're going to go back to school when they help, still have symptoms. The things that we worry about less is actually the bacterial infections. We worry more about the viral infections. Those are the ones that are really catchy. Um, but yeah, 24 hours fever-free is pretty good rule of thumb. Not perfect, I admit. Another question, can you provide one or two strategies in getting this information to providers? What a great question. Uh, this webinar is recorded and it's available as a YouTube video. And so that's one great example is to pass it on to your providers. Um, you know, these, this is designed to be five quick hits. So these are five easy things you can do at the bedside. So if you have a physician champion who wants to go to the med staff meeting, who wants to, um, who wants to go to their departmental meeting, a departmental head, for example, you could just give them this summary slide and say, hey, you know, quality attended this webinar on antimicrobial stewardship. Here are five tips we can bring to the bedside today. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone if you want to put me in charge with any or in touch with any clinical leader and talk about ways to improve antimicrobial use. Um, we are here for you guys. You are our members. Um, and I'm happy to help if you want to have a doc to doc conversation on any of these topics. Um, but this is all very evidence based. None of this is controversial. The problem with or not the problem, the challenge of quality measures is bringing this to the bedside. That's exactly uh, or medical quality in general. It's, it's not the science, it's actually the implementation of the science. And so um, education only goes so far. 
I think the more that we can put um, protocols in place, the more that we can actually change our order sets, things like that, I think that probably has the most effect on um, our clinicians. I know in my hospital, we did a um, an education campaign, not just for, for providers, but also for patients. And so we had standardized discharge instructions to explain to the patients why we might not be prescribing antibiotics for their sinus infections or their dentalgia or their pharyngitis. Um, because oftentimes it's patient expectations as well as provider practice. Great. Those are all the questions that we got. If, um, if you have any further questions, please email us. Um, so thank you all for joining the Second Journal Club. Hopefully you found this format useful. We'll continue to tweak it as we have more of these events. Um, I will be emailing all the registrants a document with instructions on how to get your CME credit. Note that the portal will be active starting right after this event and will close on July 11th, 2018 at 4 p.m. Central Time. Um, I will also make the recording avail available to you soon. So um, the, a link to the recording as well as the document for CME instructions will come to you um, pretty soon after this event. Um, if you have any questions or suggestions for us, please don't hesitate to email us. And we hope to see you all at the next Journal Club taking place at the same time on August 13th, titled Evidence-Based Strategies to Prescribe Antibiotics More Effectively. Thanks, everyone, and have a good rest of the week.